You can get comfortable, you can drink your coffee, you can relax. And you know it's going to be a good Easter when the flowers are blooming and the snow is falling, amen? Amen. Woo, come on, happy Easter to every single one of you, whether you're joining us from uh, one of our campuses at Rochester or Webster or at our online campus, we are so grateful to each and every one of you. And can I say, welcome home to everybody. And if you're a guest with us, we say those words really intentionally. Because what could easily feel like a crowd of people, we want to feel like a family. A place where you can come, grab a warm cup of coffee, a glass of lemonade, a place where you can come as you are, but you can grow and learn more about Jesus Christ. And so we are honored to have you here this morning. We get... There's a lot of things going on Easter weekend, right? From the egg hunts to the parties to the food, and we're just grateful that you would choose to come spend a little piece of your holiday weekend here at Northridge Church, and so welcome to each and every one of you. My name is Drew, and I'm I'm married to my beautiful wife, Ashley, and we have four children. Yes, I said four children, and it's it's wild, and it's crazy in the Karshner household. It's loud, it's obnoxious. And we love it that way. In fact, I tell people all the time, my wife and I, we love each other so much that we just keep having kids. (laughs) I'll I'll leave the details up to you for that one. Um, But here's what's crazy. Every time my wife would come up to me and say, hey, I'm, I'm pregnant, we would celebrate, we would get excited, we would be ready to go, but I don't know if any other guy can relate or identify with me, but it just never felt real. I mean, I knew we were pregnant, I, when I say we ladies, I mean my wife was pregnant, okay, easy. I, and I saw like her deal with the nine months of the struggle of pregnancy, right? From, from nausea to tiredness to the hormones and the body change, right? But I don't know why, but as a guy who didn't feel any of those changes, like I, I knew we were having a baby, but I, I really it felt like we were in this limbo period forever until it changed. Until about, you know, that first night, Two, three in the morning, that baby started crying. And I was like, babe, what's that noise? Where are we? Who's doing that? And it was like, oh man, we have a baby. It was like a, a dose of reality hit me in the face. And I would suggest we've all had moments in our life where reality didn't sink in until it hit us right square in the face. Maybe it was like this for you who used to be an athlete. Maybe you played sports in high school and in college and you got a little bit older, you still went out to that field or that court and your mind told you, you go for it and your body was like, no, we shouldn't have gone for it. A nice reality check. Or maybe, you know, summer's rolling around and you're like, we gotta go get that boat or that house or that thing we love to do. And you're like, let's buy it. And then you look at your savings and your checking and that reality hits you. Like, no, we we shouldn't do that. Because we all have had doses of reality. Where reality hit us right in the face. And I think over the last two years, in the season that we've endured and the things that we've had to navigate, we've all had reality checks. And what happens is when reality hits us, we often doubt things and ask questions. And I would bet many of you have asked questions like these. Do I want to do this job anymore? Do I want to live in the state of New York anymore? You all probably asked that question when you woke up this morning. (laughs) Do I... do I want to eat this way anymore? Is this the life I really want? And, and not only did we have reality checks in everyday living, but I would bet over the last two years, we had some spiritual reality checks where some of you, maybe you're still answering this question, do I still want to believe this anymore? Do I want to give my time and my talent and my treasures to this anymore? And you see, this morning, I think we're going to wrestle with the most important reality check in all of life, and it comes to deal with the backing of our faith. Because when, when when I ask you this question, right, what is your faith resting on? What is your faith banking on? For many of us, our faith banks on religious activities, Right, we believe that if we read our Bible enough, we go to church enough, we we do all the, the right things, we pray a lot, that our faith will be strong. 
For some of us, our faith is, is banking on good deeds, right? If, if I just get to the end of my life and my good outweighs my bad, my faith will be strong. Some of you, your faith is resting on your grandparents or your parents' faith. But today, the reality check is really, truly where our faith rests. And the question that we have to wrestle with today is, is the resurrection of Jesus true? Did it actually happen? Or do we just every year buy into this scam, this fairy tale that makes us all feel good inside? But honestly, when it comes, we're here today to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus, but is that real? Is that true, or is it just a fairy tale? And the Bible actually has this reality check. The apostle Paul had to deal with this very same thing. He actually talks about it in 1 Corinthians. Look what he says, he says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And so here there were doubters, people who were doubting the resurrection. They were having this reality check. Is this really real? And look what Paul says. He says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. And so the apostle Paul says, some of you are doubting the resurrection, if it's real. And if the resurrection isn't real, all of us right now are wasting our time. Right, our faith is useless, my preaching is useless. We should all, honestly, if Jesus isn't alive, we should all probably go to the egg hunt or go get some good food with family because this is kind of nonsense. The singing and the, the shouting and the preaching, it's useless if Jesus is still dead. And I would bet that some of you today, whether you're watching at home or you're at one of our campuses, you doubt the resurrection. You're still not sure. Like you, you, okay, I, I get it. Like, I understand the story, but I, come on, really? Like, Jesus died and then came back to life? Like, nobody does that. Is it real? And you know what's true? That was true for the very first Easter, for some of the people who, was, who were closest to Jesus. Right, let me show you a couple examples. Matthew 28, it says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. So these are Jesus' best friends to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So this is after Jesus' resurrection. He says, meet me at, in Galilee. And so his disciples go to, to meet Jesus. It says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. How crazy is that to think? They are looking at a resurrected Jesus, a guy who they saw die scattered, and now they're looking at him back to life, and yet still, some doubted. Didn't believe. There was another uh, a, a disciple, one of Jesus' closest friends, who wasn't there in that moment. His name was Thomas. Look what it says. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So he didn't get to see Jesus in real life resurrection form. And so the other disciples said, we've seen Jesus. He's alive, Thomas. You've got to believe it. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. So some of the people closest to Jesus, who watched him do miracle after miracle, and yet they didn't buy the resurrection. They were still doubting. And have you ever wondered why so many people doubt the resurrection? Where did that come from? Well, let me show you. It actually comes from the very first Easter, Matthew chapter 28. It says, while the women were on their way, so a bunch of Marys going to the tomb to wrap Jesus' body in spices, but before they get to the tomb, there were guards guarding the tomb who noticed the stone was rolled away, Jesus' body isn't there, and so they have to do something. It says, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. Uh, Jesus' body is missing. This isn't good. When the chief priests had met with the elders, guess what they did? They devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And to, this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. You see, from the very 
first Easter, when the resurrection happened, seeds of doubt were sown. Right, right at the very beginning, people lied, gave false testimony to disprove, to cause you generations later, thousands of years later, to doubt the fact that Jesus is alive. And I would suggest there are probably a significant amount of people who really wonder, is Jesus really alive? Did he really rise from the dead? And we wrestle with these doubts and and what it does is it causes us to ask questions and we wrestle with two things. We wrestle with the validity of the resurrection and we wrestle with the impact of the resurrection. And those two things cause us to ask questions, right? The validity and the impact of the resurrection causes us to ask a couple questions. Some of you are asking, like, was Jesus really the son of God? Or was he just kind of an ordinary man? And did he actually come back to life? And then if that's true, some of you are asking, can that change my life? Can that transform who I am and my friends? Can that really give me hope and joy in the midst of any season, in any circumstance? Can it really give my life purpose and meaning? And here's what I want you to know today. Christians over all of the world don't gather on Easter to celebrate a fairy tale. But there is actual evidence that proves to Jesus' resurrection. We don't just seem to celebrate something that makes us feel good, but there is a foundation for our belief in Jesus being alive. And today I want to share just two pieces of evidence that point to the resurrection of Jesus. The first piece of evidence is the eyewitness accounts. You see, we're lucky through our Bible to have people who actually walked in history on that day, who saw with their own eyes, and we have a record of that. You think if you're trying to prove anything in life, in in a courtroom, one of the first places that people go is who was there and who saw what? And that's what we should do with the resurrection, okay? Who was there that day and what do they say? And there are a lot, multiple people who claim Jesus was alive. Let me go through a couple of them. The first one, her name is Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was with Jesus the entire journey, Right? She gave birth to Jesus, she taught Jesus, she helped Jesus grow older, and then eventually she saw Jesus be arrested. She saw Jesus be flogged. She saw Jesus stand on trial. She saw her son hang on a cross. She saw him die, and she saw him buried. And then she went to the tomb. Mary went to the tomb, not to see Jesus back alive, but to wrap his body in spices. And when the body wasn't there, she wasn't like, oh yeah, my son's alive. No, she was distraught. But then Jesus came to her and said, Mom, I'm alive. And Mary was like, oh, oh, wow. And so she goes and tells the people closest to Jesus, the 12 disciples, people like John. John was a disciple of Jesus. He saw him resurrected. Someone like Thomas, remember Thomas, the guy who doubted, who said, hey, unless I see it with my own eyes, I won't believe. Well, Jesus showed up to Thomas. And he said, hey, why don't you put your hands where my scars are. Why don't you put your hands in my side? And Thomas, who was doubting, believed because he saw Jesus. We see a guy like Peter, a guy who denied Christ three times. When Jesus went on trial, he scattered, and people were like, aren't you the guy who was hanging out with Jesus? He's like, no, not me, not me. He saw the resurrected Jesus. Some of Jesus' family, his half-brothers, James and Jude, guys who didn't believe in Jesus at first, but they saw Jesus alive. And we see their testimonies all throughout the Bible. And so there are multiple eyewitnesses that claim Jesus is alive. But that leads us to another question, right? I know any skeptic is going to ask this question. Okay, cool, awesome, great. The Bible records that, right? But how reliable are those sources? Right? Anybody can make up anything. How do we know how reliable the source is of those eyewitness accounts? Well, we find those eyewitness accounts through the Bible, the New Testament. And so what we need to do is take the Bible through any, like, any rigors that any ancient text would go through to, to prove that it's a trustworthy historical document. And so the first way that scholars took, take any ancient text and see if it's trustworthy is the first thing they say is, how many documents have we collected? Right, because we wanna see the evidence over multiple manuscripts. And so just to give you an example of an ancient text, Many of you, probably all of you, have heard of Homer's work on the Iliad. 
Homer's work is, is read in literature classes, and probably many of you have actually read it. It is an ancient text. It's one of the pinnacle texts in, in, with historians because the, Homer's Iliad has 2,000 manuscripts that historians could navigate and look through to prove its accuracy. And so you look at historians, there is not one historian out there that would say that the, 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 the Homer's Iliad is not a valid history piece that can be accepted. Every historian accepts it. So how does the Bible compare to that? 2,000 manuscripts. Well, the New Testament alone has 25,000 manuscripts. 8,000 in Latin, 5,000 in Greek, thousands in other languages. The ancient text of the Bible, New Testament and Old, is unparalleled to any other ancient text. But that leads us to another question. Okay, so documents collected, we've got a bunch of those, but how accurate are those documents as they pass through time? Have people changed the Bible through generations? Like, are the words of the Bible still the same when they were first written? And so scholars have spent years studying the manuscripts of the Bible. There are so many. And just to give you one example, according to the German Bible Society, if you look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, here's what's amazing, is over the course of thousands of years, that passage had zero differences through thousands of years. And so it passes the test. What's amazing is you have eyewitness accounts who said Jesus is alive, and if you study and you take the Bible through the rigors of any ancient text, it passes with flying colors. In fact, look what one scholar says. He says, the quantity of the New Testament manuscripts is unparalleled in ancient literature. There are over 5,000 Greek manuscripts, 8,000 Latin manuscripts, and another 1,000 manuscripts in other languages. The Old and New Testament pass the bibliographic internal and external texts like no other ancient books. The evidence strongly supports the accuracy of the Bible in relation to history and culture. But in many cases, it has been overlooked or rejected because of philosophical presuppositions that run contrary to the scriptures. This leads to a double standard. Critics approach secular literature with one standard, but wrongly use a different standard when they examine the Bible. Look at this. It says, those who discard the Bible as historically untrustworthy must realize that the same standard would force them to eliminate almost all ancient literature. And so if we look at the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus, there were people who saw it who claim it's real. The documents that record that history are verified and proven like any other ancient text. And yet I still don't believe that's the greatest piece of evidence to Jesus being alive. You see, if you go back to those people, who, those eyewitness accounts that claim Jesus was alive, if you follow the path of their life, I think the greatest piece of evidence is what happened after they said Jesus was alive. Because if you study their journeys, almost every single one of the people who claimed Jesus was alive were tortured and ultimately killed so you could know that he was alive. Now think about that for a second. These people who saw Jesus come back to life did everything they could to spread the news that Jesus was alive so much that it ended up killing them. Now as you think about that, think about our culture today. There are very few people today that would actually surrender their life for something they believe to be true. We have really bad examples of this in our history, right? People like terrorists and cult members who buy a lie, who believe something is true, and they give up their life for it. But can I tell you what history doesn't have? There is not one person in history who would surrender their life for something they knew to be a lie. Not one. And so these people who claim Jesus was alive saw something and they challenged people to look at the resurrection and the evidence. They gave up their lives so today we could experience and know that Jesus is alive. And so when we look at the evidence, the clear conclusion is the resurrection actually happened. That today we can stand boldly, we can celebrate and we can sing that Jesus went to that cross in our place and paid our penalty and died and then three days later, guess what? We celebrate today, church, because Jesus is alive and that changes everything. 
He's alive. Look what Paul says. It says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for since death came through a man. That was Adam in the garden. The resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. That's Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all have been made alive. And so as we look at the evidence, I actually believe it takes more faith to not believe in the resurrection than it does to actually believe in the resurrection because the evidence point to Jesus being alive. So let me ask you this question. I build up all this way to ask you just a personal question. How will that truth impact your life? If Jesus is really alive, how will that change you? And I'm not talking to the person sitting next to you. I'm not talking to your spouse. I'm not talking about your mom or your dad, your grandparents. I'm talking to you as an individual. I'm talking to me. How, if I look square at the evidence and I come to the conclusion that, man, Jesus did die and he came back to life, how is that going to radically change my life? And so let me just give you a couple of options because I know in an audience as as large as this, right, there's multiple responses. For some of you here today, you still don't buy it, right? You still have questions. You still have doubts. I I get it. I see some evidence, but I'm going to need a little more convincing, Drew. And if if, if that's you today, you've got doubts, you still don't buy it, that's okay. And I want you to know we are so grateful that you're here listening this morning. And here's my challenge to you. I would just challenge you in the midst of your doubts to continue to wrestle with them, to continue to seek and find the truth because here's what I believe. If you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you and he'll reveal the truth to you. Uh, There's stories in this church of people who once doubted but now believe because God pursued them, chased after them. And today, and what I love about our church is This is a safe space for you to have doubts. We have an environment for people called Starting Point where you can come in a small group and you got loads of questions about the gospel, about God, about Jesus, and you can ask them and we'll do our best to answer any questions that you have because we genuinely want you to know the truth. So just wrestle with those doubts. Pursue the truth, pursue God, and I promise you, he will reveal himself to you. But for some of you today, The Spirit of God has been working on your heart. He's been drawing you through conversations, through circumstances. You can feel it, right? You've been trying to get away from God and you just can't, right? You've been running, you've been hiding, you've been trying to out-sin God. He's like, I already paid for that. And today, maybe you just make the choice to allow the resurrection to change your life. I'm living testimony That if you put your faith and trust in a a savior who is alive, he will transform you. He will transform you from the inside out. He'll give you hope in every circumstance. He'll give you peace that doesn't make sense. He'll give your life purpose and meaning despite the chaoticness and the craziness and the turmoil of life. Because the resurrection, if you truly believe in it, it will transform who you are. And maybe today you're just ready for that. You're ready for a savior who is alive to invade your life and to lead it. Would you allow the resurrection to change your life? And then for many of us, many of us are here today just to celebrate the resurrection because we're living proof of it. We've seen the evidence of how God has changed our lives and so today is a party, today is a celebration and if you're a follower of Christ and you believe in the resurrection, what I would challenge you today with your family and your friends, with good food, with Easter egg hunts, rejoice and be confident that your faith is not blind. Right, we don't believe in some fairy tale that makes us feel good. There is actual evidence, historical evidence that says Jesus is alive and so don't let anybody tell you that ain't real because you can stand on the foundation and the truth and the evidence that God is alive today. And so we can be confident, we can stand up and we can rise up and here's what I can tell you. I know people will argue history with you. I know people will argue the the eyewitness accounts all day long but let me tell you something they can't argue with, how God has changed your life. Right? They can't argue with what God has done in your life. The Bible says, let your light or your life shine before men that they would see the works of God and it would be evident that he is alive. 
And so maybe all we need to prove the resurrection is to allow the, the, the resurrection to transform us and that light to shine to our neighbors, our coworkers, and we can be confident today that Jesus is alive. And so let me wind down here. Remember Thomas? Doubting Thomas is what they call him in the Bible. He was one of the disciples, one of the persons closest to Jesus. He saw Jesus do miracle and miracle, and yet he still doubted. He said, unless I see it with my own eyes, I won't believe it. And Jesus walks into the room and he says, Thomas, look, see, touch. And in that moment, Thomas believes. He believes that Jesus is alive. But I love what Jesus says at the end of that passage, at the end of that story in John chapter 20. It says, then Jesus told him, that's Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So my question for you today, as we look at the evidence of the resurrection, as we stand to celebrate that Jesus is alive, my question for you today is, are you ready to believe? Are you ready to push your doubts, your questions aside, and take a leap of faith? Where today with your life, you declare that Jesus is alive. And maybe you know this is your moment because you can feel maybe your heart beating, racing. Maybe you can feel like I'm speaking right to you, that God right now is drawing your soul and your heart to himself. And I want to give you a chance to respond. And so if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes with me, maybe that's you today. Where you're ready to cross that line of faith, where you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, where you're ready to declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he is alive. If that's you today, here's what I would challenge you to do. Just say these words. And don't say them to me. Say them to the God of the universe. Just say, God, I'm a sinner. And the evidence of my sin is all over my life. It's, ca- it's held me captive made me a slave and everything I do try to do to shake from the bondage of my sin it fails me and yet Jesus has set me free through his cross that de- his death on that cross and through rising again three days later and so today God I am choosing to put my faith and my trust in your son's work through his death and through his resurrection I believe. And so today, God, I pray that you'd help me turn from my sin. I I pray that you would be my forgiver and my leader and that you today and for the rest of my life would transform me from the inside out. Be my savior. And the Bible says if you said that prayer and you meant it in your heart, the Bible says you will be saved. It's the beginning of a new journey, a relationship with the God of the universe. So I have one challenge for you. If you said that prayer, would you just tell somebody? Tell a friend, tell the person who invited you. Tell me, tell our church, man, we just want to celebrate with you. And so let somebody know, because we can be confident today that our Savior, Jesus, is alive. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for Easter. Everything rides on today, God. And God, as we search and we look we see that all of creation points to the resurrection. All I gotta do is look at the flowers. They were dead and you see them coming back to life. Like your, your earth cries out that you are alive. And God, I pray today that somebody today cross that line of faith. God, I pray that you'd surround them with people who will help them walk with you, guide them and teach them. God, I pray for the person who, who still has doubts that they would wrestle and that you would reveal yourself to them. And God, I pray for your church today, your believers, that today would be a celebration, that we would let our lights and our lives shine before men, that they may see you are alive. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.